Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean. Today we're on location at Freel Good Performance with the owner Taylor and we're going to install some outboard shock relocation kits. So I want you guys to get to know the owner a little bit better. So I'm going to hand it over to Taylor and he's going to tell you a little bit about his background and what he does here at the shop. Hey guys, Taylor Freel, uh, owner and operator of Freel Good Performance. We recently release our outboard shock relocation kits uh, available exclusively on Opt Off Road. Our main goal with these is to try to add some value to the community. Yes, outboard shock relocations have been done. On our specific outboard shock relocations, we did a few changes. One of those being all the tubing that are used in our shock relocations are all BOM. So today we're gonna be going over how to assemble them if you've ordered a kit. What Sean is holding right now is how it comes if you buy them pre-welded, which there is an additional fee to have it welded. Everything comes pretty much ready to slap on the vehicle. The only thing that needs to be welded is these points here to the frame, which makes it really easy. You can prep the frame out. Uh, even watching this video, we're gonna cover not just assembling it, but installing it onto the vehicle itself. So the huge benefit of these is one, you're gonna be able to run a longer shock, which means you're gonna be able to get more travel out of your suspension. On top of that, you're going to be able to have better access to those shocks. Um, as I'm sure you've seen in some of Sean and Tim's past videos, it kind of sucks getting those factory shocks off. Uh, with this, you can actually get the shock off without even having to remove your wheel and tire. It makes it super easy. On top of that, you're getting more stability bringing them outboard. Uh, there's a reason Toyota started making them outboard on the newer models, because it's a good design. With this kit, we tried to make it universal so you can run anywhere from a 10 to a 12 inch shock. It's fully adjustable during install, so you can run either one. Typically with your factory shock location, you're running about, I believe an eight inch. Shock. So this allows you to get a much bigger shock into that location. So Taylor, we'd like to know a little bit more about your background, why you started FGP, and how long you've been around, and what your specialties are. Um, well, I've been fabricating for about the last 12 years. 27 now, started when I was 15 years old. My father had picked me up a 96 S10 two-wheel drive pickup. I got heavily, heavily into mini trucks to the point where our, our little pickup that was supposed to be a, a very simple get running and paint it and drive turned into body modifications, air ride suspension, sitting on the ground. And that kind of flourished into me discovering my love for cutting things up and, and making stuff cool again. So started off with that and then eventually graduated into getting into Toyotas, got into four wheel drive Toyotas, started messing around with straight axle stuff, long travel stuff, um, going in the desert or rock crawling. Got major, major into the Toyota stuff and haven't quite gotten out of it yet. Decided that I was unhappy with my current path and wanted to do something of my own. So about a year and a half ago, I started taking my side work a little more seriously and bringing more in eventually got to the point where I was busy enough and so was my business partner. We were busy enough to where we were able to leave our full-time jobs and pursue this full-time about a little over a year ago. And uh, shortly after, got into the shop that we're in now and it's been a blast ever since. And it's never a, a dull day. Always, always busy, always working on Toyotas. Awesome. Yeah, Taylor does some great work on sliders, these outboard shock relocation kits, custom fabrication. He's currently working on Sandy, Jason from Opt Off Roads rig. It's a pretty iconic rig in the third gen community. So if you haven't seen his rig, go check it out. We'll link it in the video description below. But without further ado, let's get started with this sick mod and start to show you how everything fits together, weld it up and get it on the truck. So in this kit, We've obviously got the main hoops here that it comes with. We've got the two tubes that go on the ends here. So in the back side of the hoop, and we have the two tubes that go on the front side. These come with plates 
to cap the ends. Those go there. These go here. And those get welded on like that. And then finish down like that. So it gets all nice and cleaned up. After that, you've got two plates. These get welded to the frame that this tube, this front tube sits on. And then you've got these triangle shaped ones that that back tube will sit on. So there's two of those. There's two of these. You also get, these are the lower shock tabs. So these get mounted to the factory shock tab brace. And then you've got your upper shock tabs that go here. So with this kit oh, and your bolts. So with this kit, this is everything that you're gonna have with the kit. Um, you can also order it welded, which is going to basically come like this. Now this one's a prototype. It's an HRU tubing instead of the DOM that the kits come with. But this is a good example of what you will receive. Uh, the tubes are welded, they're ground down, cleaned up. Uh, everything is pretty much ready to, to go. The only thing that's obviously not welded is gonna be your lower shock tab. So what we're gonna be doing is showing, basically once you get this kit, uh, what to expect. We're gonna show welding the caps on, grinding those down, Gonna try to give you guys a good example of welding it on the bench. You can also do it on the ground as well as welding it on the vehicle. Uh, the good thing about this kit is there's no exact science to it. Nothing has to be perfect on this kit necessarily. There is a couple pointers that we'll point out just to help guide you along. As far as I'm concerned, someone could install this very easily, no tape measure, and get everything just right the first time. So it's very, simple put together and hopefully this video can help you guys out with uh, assembling it further and feeling more confident in getting it onto your vehicle. So this is our welder setup. We've got a Miller 211 and a 212. Essentially they're the same unit just in a different body. Uh, that holds a 30 pound spool. This one holds an 11 pound spool. This one is our traveler. It pretty much goes around the shop whenever we do install stuff like that. For purposes of easement, we're going to go ahead and be using this one. It is a more cost-efficient welder. They're fairly inexpensive considering the amount of power that they put out. There's an adapter. So even for the guys that are obviously not running 220 in their garage, because not everybody has that, this unplugs, and you've got your 110 that plugs right in. So even for a hobbyist, this welder is awesome. I will say this one has far surpassed my expectations and even from a production standpoint has at least stood up for the past year and a half and done extremely well. This is connected to a shielding gas. Uh, so we've got 75-25 uh, argon CO2 mix. Most people aren't gonna be running a tank this big, but we try to avoid as many trips to the gas shop as possible. Um, so we've got shielding gas. I would recommend if you are going to be welding this kit on that you do use shielding gas. Flux core is a decent way to go about it. Uh, most times flux core welders have a difficult time getting penetration. It's gonna be a really, really dirty weld. This helps ensure that the weld is clean. Doesn't always ensure that you're gonna get good penetration but it will be a much nicer, cleaner, stronger weld. Flux is very uh, brittle. It's a very brittle weld, whereas this is a little bit softer weld. It has a little more give, so it's less likely to end up with cracks and stuff like that. The settings are gonna be different depending on what welder you have. Most welders are going to have a chart, either on the inside with its instruction manual. Uh, they're gonna have basically a, a baseline, a, a guideline of what type of steel you're welding, uh, what thickness of steel you're welding, and where you kind of want to start off with having that welder set up at. Now, it's not always gospel, so it is something that I would recommend if you're new to welding. Practice on some scrap steel first so you can kind of get an idea of the different settings that you want to use for this kit. 
Uh, that way you don't just jump in and you're laying down welds that you're really not comfortable welding with. Again, these are just a baseline. Miller is pretty accurate with their baselines. Obviously other welders are going to be a little bit different. So you want to find that happy medium. So front support tube and top plate get set onto the top of there. Give it a small tack on that side. Small tack there. Now you don't necessarily have to run a bead all the way around this. This is going to be getting ground down and this is made to where there is a crevice. I don't know if you can see it. There is a crevice in there. So as you're welding, you're filling that crevice with weld so that when you grind it down, you still have material left to hold it. So you don't have to worry about running a bead. You can essentially just go around this with tack welds, which is what we're gonna do. Obviously, be careful. Move on to this one. So we just get that lined up. I found it best to just pinch the sides here and here. Give a tack on the top. A little tack on the bottom. So this is your back to, and obviously same thing, we've got that crevice that we're going to fill. So that way as you grind it and take material off, you're not having to worry about taking too much weld away and taking any structural part of that weld away. Same thing with this, we're just going to send taps all the way around. thing that I have found to get this cleaned up uh, obviously you can put it on just like this it's your kit you can do whatever you need to um, I found the easiest way is to get a set of ice grips and an angle grinder and just kind of set it down either on the ground or the bench kind of work your way around it a lot of times it's easier if it's hanging off of something. So just work around it, work around it, get the face of it, and eventually with a little bit of practice and cleaning up, you should get something like this. Again, it doesn't need to look exactly like this, but something similar is kind of the goal. Just something nice and clean. This capped end isn't necessarily structural, so don't be afraid to clean it up, make it pretty. I have found that using a flap disc like this does seem to yield the best results. You want to start off with a little bit heavier grit. You can always go down, like start off with a 40 or an 80 grit and eventually bring it to like 120, which is a little bit finer grit. But these work really well. If you use something like this, it's just very hard and coarse. So you're liable to end up digging grooves into the tube, which we definitely don't want to do. The main purpose here is just to clean up this weld. It's not to dig into the tube or dig into the face here.
grinder and paint makes the world of you ain't. <laughs> so with the two shock hoops, we do want to keep in mind these are the same, but we are going to have a passenger and a driver's side. So when we weld these together, we want to make sure that we have one facing one way, one facing the other. Uh, we definitely don't want to have this happen. Now we have two passenger side hoops. So bear that in mind. All it takes is flipping it over that way. And now we have your driver's side and your passenger side. So we're gonna put one of these to the side. We've got our ground down pieces ready to go. And we are going to start with just something to space this up just a hair. In fact, I think I'm gonna use something a little bit thinner, probably 3 16 uh, which these are 3 16 so we can use those. These are your back plates. So just level that out. And there's no exact science to this. You can't necessarily do it wrong. We do want it spaced out a little bit because underneath here, um, it is gonna get tight. We're gonna have a weld line around this tube and we're gonna have a weld line around this tube as it gets welded to this plate here. So we do want a little bit of gap to work with so that we can get our spool gun in there. So we get that lined up. Um, and I spatter spray will help with some cleanup. So on this hoop, the stronger angle here is going to be the front. So this is going to be towards the front of the vehicle. And then this is going to be towards the rear of the vehicle as seen in this model that it's already done. So your mount is going to be obviously towards the front. So this flat end, your flat tube is going to be at the front, angled one is going to be at the back. So we've got that spaced out. Hit it one more time. So for now, we're just going to be tacking this in. We don't want to start going crazy and final welding stuff. each side um, so something to keep in mind when you are welding this this front mount you'll notice there is a difference in height in these and part of that reason is this front mount the tube that sticks out of the frame sticks out just shy of a half inch so you want to make sure that when you weld this end on there's a reason this is longer. The top end is going to line up with the tube, so you don't have it like this, like this, sideways. Don't worry about it being up and down. Technically, you can, but uh, the kit is designed to have this top portion line up with this tube. Now, the reason this is longer is because you're going to need to space this up because of that extrusion from the frame on the Toyota factory frame. So again, we take, and you can still use more of the pieces of the kit. You don't necessarily have to have steel laying around. We're using the lower shock mounts there and just kind of spacing that up just a little bit. And again, there's no exact science to this, so it does not need to be Perfect. You do want to make sure that it's pretty well level going all the way across. Line up the top of that with the tube. Anti-spatter. And you'll notice without the anti-spatter, the spots where you ground down, the spatter from the welder is definitely going to stick to those spots a lot easier. So that's why it's typically nice to have that anti-spatter. 
make sure that's lined up again. Right back there. And a little tack there. Again, we're not final welding this yet. We're just getting everything tacked together, set up. Uh, so now that we have everything tacked, we are going to pause on assembly and go ahead and get these welded up. So now we've got both of the support tubes welded on. Careful hot. And we're going to, again, start spacing these out. You can use various things laying around. front plate that gets mounted it's gonna go here and we're gonna do a couple of tacks and then same thing over here we are going to space this up just a little bit more typically I try to put basically if, if you lay this out flat. I try to give this just a slight angle. Not a whole lot. And the reason being is because the Toyota frame does start to kind of taper down just a hair where this mounts. You can put it straight. No harm in that. You can line it up exactly to this. I try to give it just a little tiny bit of angle. That way it kind of goes with the flow of the frame a little bit. It doesn't need to be perfect. Maybe 10 degrees over, we'll say. Maybe 10 degrees over. And then just throw a couple tack welds on there. And final weld. And that's it. this cool down and we're going to go ahead and tackle the second one while this is cooling down. And same thing, again you want to make sure you're not welding both of the same side. So make sure before you just toss this one out, you've got the two sharp bends together. You've got these two bends apart or vice versa. If you welded this side first, this one over here. You just want to make sure that you're, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Symmetrical in things. So do not weld the same side. <laughs> then it gets complicated. So just make sure you compare. Make sure you're not welding the same side. This, the two sharp bends are together, so you know that you're doing another side now. Right now, you just want to make sure that both of these are flip flop from each other. 
move that off to the side, and we're gonna go ahead and weld up this one. to the point we've got all of our end tubes welded on we've got all of our frame plates welded on to the end tubes as you can see a couple ways of going about getting these mounted as a production standpoint i don't have customer shocks here often to mock up majority of shocks is inch and a half mounting so if you have extra tubing you can just cut out a little piece of tube, inch and a half long, and use that to space out your upper brackets. Now, if you don't have tubing laying around that you can cut up, highly recommend taping off your shock first, and you can just use your shock to essentially do the same thing. This just makes it a little bit easier if you've got it. That way you don't have to worry about taping this off, Although it may be going on an off-road vehicle, that doesn't mean you necessarily want to scratch your shock up while you're installing it. You want to scratch it up while you're on the trail. So for these, I'm going to show both methods. We're going to go ahead and get this bolted onto here and with the provided hardware. So these are grade eight bolts. This is also not a nylon locking nut, but it is a locking nut so it's a press so everything's going to be nice and tight nothing's going to come loose on the trail and then these are going to be both sides are 19 millimeter so keep in mind when assembling these these are directional uh, you have one side that's just a little bit longer, as you can see here. So it's a little bit further away from where that hole is. You can always go to Opt Off Road's website and basically look at the diagram on there. And how these get mounted is the longer side is going to face the front side of the vehicle. So it's going to be facing down on the hoop. The short side is going to be here. Uh, the reason for this is it puts the mounting a little bit further back. Um, you can mount it like this, but then it brings the mounting position down instead of back. So there is a proper and improper way of mounting this. Just make sure that long side's on the bottom. So keeping that in mind, we've got a reservoir that's going to be coming out this way. So we want to make sure the long side is not on the same side as that reservoir. Put on the back side here. And then we're going to snug those down. So, we gotta make sure our long side is on here. We got two different methods of doing this. Again, if you don't have any tubing, just use your shock. Just be careful, you wanna tape it off. Uh, slag sticks to stainless line very easily. So you wanna make sure that's taped off. You wanna make sure it's taped off here. As you can see, it's already got a little bit of gouge there. 
and just as we work with it, you want to protect what you're putting on. So we're going to do this one with this method, uh, cutting the tube down to an inch and a half. So this bracket sneaks right over that tubing, nice and easy. And if you can see, you have points where the bend starts and points where it ends. And you pretty much just want to line up as best as you can. Again, it doesn't need to be perfect, but line up as best as you can to where those bends start. And get a better angle there. So line up to where those bends start, put it slightly off center. And you're going to look through here, through these little window peaks, and you want to make sure that this section here almost entirely covers that there. And the reason for that is because you want to make sure that you have enough room for your shock, which when you're mounting these with your shock, you're obviously going to see like, hey, you know, there's enough room here, there's not enough room here. But just as kind of a fail safe, you want to make sure that that's pretty well covered up right there. And then your points here and here. You got your long side over here, starts at the bend here, ends where the bend stops here. And again, there's no exact science to it. It can be a little bit this way. It can be a little bit this way, but that's basically where you want it to roughly be is where those start and where those end. You wanna space it up a little, just a little bit. Just makes it a little bit easier because you got the rest of this bolt hanging out here. So you've got your ends lined up and now you can get it tack welded on. And same thing on the other side. So at this point is when you want to stop don't find a weld, check out your gaps, make sure that everything lines up, make sure that this bracket is straight with the rest of this. Now, if it's not 100%, that's okay. The main thing is you wanna make sure that you have a nice tight gap here so that you can fill it with weld. If you'll notice on this one, we do have a little bit of space here, which we can easily fix with a little clamp. And it doesn't matter whether it's vice grip, bench clamp, but you see we can close that gap up and we can probably throw another tack weld there and then final weld it. So there we have it, got the first one welded on, careful, hot, and we're going to go ahead and move on to the second one. On the second one, I'm upside down, <laughs> that is your shock, which is going to be a little bit more difficult, but that's okay. And essentially you want to try to make sure that this is lined up just the same. So where the bend starts, where the bend ends, long side is at the bottom. So front facing side. We're going to get that lined up. We're going to make sure that through these sight holes that you're pretty well just covering the tubing. And then same thing, we're gonna go ahead and tack this. Double check 
make sure everything still lines up because this other bracket has a tendency to shift. You gotta remember, we kept this loose. So make sure everything's lined up before you tack it, which we did, everything's good. And at this point, we've got our tacks done. We're gonna go ahead and remove the shock so we don't do any more damage to the shock itself. So now that we have that out of here, we're going to go ahead and put this to the side. And the really cool thing about these particular brackets, because they have a radius to them, we don't have to worry so much as if it were sitting right here, just on a flat surface. You have more of an opportunity for that bracket to deflect. As you heat, heat this up, metal is going to shrink in different ways it's going to move it pull it or push it in different ways being that this is curved around this bend we're going to have a lot less deflection as we weld it i would recommend if you're not using the tube if you're using the shock put a small tack weld here and here before final welding it that way just in case if you start welding here it doesn't start to pull away from this body so you have a nice tack right there we're going to do that on both sides. Okay. Now we can go ahead and final weld this. We're going to get our anti spatter spray on there, keep it nice and pretty. Two of two is complete. Careful hop. So we got the vehicle jacked up. It's sitting on jack stands right where the lower control arm mounts. We removed the old shocks. We're not gonna need those anymore. And we also removed the springs, the coils. We're gonna clean up the frame. We're gonna cut off the mount on the bottom of the axle. And then we're gonna start to mock things up and cycle the suspension. All right, so first things first, we need to clean up the surface so that we can weld to it. The cool part about these OSR kits is they fit right in between these two holes. So flat disc from earlier, we're gonna take and clean up the surface here. And same thing here on the face of this, and as much as we can around it so that we're not melting uh, coating back from the frame while we're trying to weld to it.
As you're cycling your suspension, you wanna be really careful about any lines that may be getting super tight. They can break, so you may need to undo some clips. The ABS lines get tight, and if you don't have an extended brake line in the rear, you should get one because it's gonna have a lot of tension. As you drop the axle down and you jack it back up and you start to articulate things and stretch things out. So just be really careful about breaking any lines. Be aware of things getting tight underneath here. Now that we got the frame prepped on both sides, we're going to place the OSR against the frame and we're gonna glue it in. Got both areas prepped. As you see, it lines up here and it lines up here. Now, as we mentioned with spacing it out, you'll notice this obviously sticks out from the frame. So that's why we have different lengths here as mentioned before. And that's why we want this to be out a little bit so that it kind of helps this run a little more parallel with the frame. You don't have to worry a whole lot about as far as where this is in relation over here. Um, I would try to get it as close to the body as you can, but do keep in mind that the back of that bolt still needs to have room. So you're gonna have a nut and bolt on this side that you still need to have clearance for, and you also don't want it to slap into your body because there is gonna be a little bit of body flex as your suspension articulates. So just bear that in mind. You can tuck it up there pretty close. Uh, it is a little bit difficult to hold this and tack it into place. So if you can get a buddy to help hold it, um, otherwise it's kind of a, a little bit of a balance, but essentially just hold it in the middle and then you can get it tacked into place up front and then tacked into place in the back. And we'll go ahead and do that now. So at this point, we can go ahead and mount the shock up and determine exactly where our bottom mount is going to be after we get this cut off. We can go ahead and get the shock mounted, get those tabs on, and figure out we've already got everything bumped out right here. So basically, wherever this lands, you do want a couple inches because you have to keep in mind that as this axle travels sideways, there is gonna be a little bit more space that it takes up past the bump stop. So we wanna keep that in mind when welding those on. Your factory shock mount has got to come off. Basically, we wanna to try to cut it as close to these factory welds as we can and just slice right through it. We don't wanna to cut too much into this. So keep that in mind, whatever you don't cut off, you can always grind down um, but as close as we can get to these factory welds, grind down the rest, and that'll be good. The sucky part is, is you have to lay under the truck to do this. Make sure when you're using this cutoff wheel that this is spinning in a direction that's not going to possibly catch and slice your face off. Uh, we highly recommend using a guard. I would definitely recommend use a guard. It's, it's the safe thing to do. So we'll go ahead and get started. And again, we're getting close to those welds. disc and clean that up. So 
So by the time you're done, we should have this area is nice and flat and clean. I do recommend prepping up just a little bit. That way, when you get everything into place, you're not having to take it back off, prep, do it again. Just prep it once. That way, when you get it together, you can tack it together, get the shock back off, final weld it, and you're going to be painting over this anyways. So before we get these on, we want to make sure that we let the nitrogen out. I understand that everybody's going to have a nitrogen bottle in their garage on hand. Uh, what you can do is as long as you have a dry, high pressure, uh, compressed air, fill these up anywhere from 180 to 280 PSI with regular air, drive to your nearest off-road shop that has nitrogen fill up, have them drain it, and refill it with nitrogen. Um, in order to install this kit though, you absolutely have to take the nitrogen out because we need to be able to fully compress this shot. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So on the end of this is just like a regular Schrader valve for like pumping up your tires or whatever. You do want to make sure when you let the nitrogen out of these that you're holding it straight up. Uh, you don't want to be trying to let, let it out right here or right here. Just hold it straight up in the air. Just like deflating the tire. So now that shaft can be pushed in to where we need it to be for full bump. And we can go ahead and get this mocked up into place. Alright, so you're going to get shock up into place and go ahead and run the slide hardware through. Uh, right now we're not super worried about bolting everything down, we're just mocking it up. So we get that bolt through, don't worry about the nut on the other side right now, at least not yet. And then you've got your tabs that go on the bottom. We're going to go ahead and get those mounted similar to how we did the top mounts. So we're going to take these bolts and we are going to actually tighten these down. So two 19 millimeter hex. We're going to tighten these down on those two tabs, just snug enough to where we can still move them around, still play with them, figure out where exactly we need to mount them. The cool part about this kit that we tried to incorporate, a lot of different companies have different shock lengths, different shock designs, uh, to where having just a a one-size-fits-all kit was a little bit difficult. The way we've got it set up, and especially using this factory mounting location, is you can move these tabs anywhere along this to get your desired height. So that means you can run a 12-inch, you can run a 10-inch, and depending on what the measurements are for your particular application, adjustments can be made Per application. It's not a one-size-fits-all, but it, it is, so you can use any shock that you want. So we're going to go ahead and get these tabs on here. Just make sure they're the same direction, obviously. And then we're going to go ahead and tighten that down. And again, we're just getting these just barely snug enough to where it still holds a little bit of pressure but not a whole lot we still need to be able to move it around but we don't want it flopping around either so right there is probably pretty good so we do want to keep in mind when we're mounting this lower mount we're gonna want just a little bit of shaft because we have to account for side to side motion. This bump stop can only do so much when it comes to side to side. This is going to twist and pick up a little bit further than where this bump stop can stop it. So we wanna make sure that we have a little bit of shaft showing still, probably anywhere from an inch to two inches. And part of these tabs is you can actually 
turn it around and flip it to where the longer side is facing up depending on your shock application. So you can mount them like this or you can twist it around and mount them like that. The whole point is that we want to make sure that we're getting as much contact on that factory bracket as we can. So we're going to go ahead and tack that into place. So at this point we have the axle pushed all the way up, all the way to the bump stops. Uh, with Dural Bumps they provide a little bit of give so we're pushing it as far up as we can so it's applying pressure onto these so we can get as close to full bump as possible before we weld those on. Now that everything is tacked together, we can go ahead and move on to the other side. So on this specific application, you're going to want to make sure that you have roughly about two inches of shaft showing. This will allow for side-to-side -side articulation without the shock bottoming out. So now that we got both sides tacked into place, we're gonna start to cycle the suspension a little bit and just confirm that both sides have clearance. We're gonna let the jack all the way down here, let the axle droop and take a look on each side. We're gonna jack up each side independently just to see how everything's working before we make our final welds. After you get the bottom tabs tacked on, not welded, but tacked, you're going to want to make sure that you cycle the suspension side to side on both sides. Make sure everything clears. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you don't have any issues with the shock contacting the frame here. Um, no issues with the shock bottoming out before the uh, bump stop does, which you are going to have to make sure by doing it side to side, not just straight up and down. So make sure you cycle it, then you can go ahead and take the shock off if everything clears and go ahead and weld everything up. and bolt with washers and instead we did the flange on them so that you don't have to oh yeah have that's washers huge. that is huge makes it so much easier oh. now what's the and torque spec on these uh german guten <laughs> that's the cool part it's a locking nut so you don't have to get super detailed as long as it's tight it's not gonna back off. So if you got shocks that have uh, external reservoir, you're gonna wanna prop it up and just kind of eyeball where you want it. And then you can get the mounts mocked up and weld it onto the bar of the OSR. Now, just like when we were mocking these shocks up to get these upper mounts welded in place, we taped them up. We're gonna tape this up again so we don't get any slag on the shock or on the line. So we got the mounts mocked up. We're holding it in place. Now you'll notice we painted the bar. We're using steel it coating, which is weldable, but for your application, if you don't have steel it, you'll want to tack these on and weld them in before you actually end up painting. So we got it where we want it and we're gonna make some tacks. You don't have to go too crazy with these welds. 
These are just going to be holding on the reservoir, which is not gonna be a huge structural component. So one of the last things you'll do here is take the tape off your shock and put on some hose clamps and tighten it down. And this isn't in the instructions, so this is a little Shawnee the Shawn Man tip. But extra HP comes from a sick sticker. Boom. At least 50 horsepower. So we got the vehicle jacked up here on one side and we're trying to simulate what it's gonna look like at full bump. We're not quite there. You'll notice the axle is not touching the Duro bump, bump stop and we still have some room for more up travel. But when we get there, we're gonna be making contact with the shock body and we're also going to be making contact with the tubing on the outboard shock relocation kit so three inches is the maximum wheel backspacing that you need to clear the osr if your wheels have a higher backspacing than that more than three inches of backspacing then you'll need to negate that with a measurement from wheel spacers so for example if you have a four inch backspaced wheel it will require a one inch wheel spacer to bring it back to three inches. And depending on your down travel, you may also wanna consider some limit straps so you don't completely extend the shock all the way, which can potentially damage it. Now the links I have on here from Opt Off Road, so the Johnny joints offer a greater range of articulation over the stock links. So if you have the stock links, those are gonna be some of your limiting factors. But if you don't and you have more travel, you may want to consider some limit straps. All right, so we're all done with this sick mod. We showed you how to weld on all these components where they need to be, get it on the frame, clean things up, cut some stuff off, and get it glued on. Now, like you saw, you need to consider wheel spacing. It's important that your wheels don't make contact with this shock relocation kit. And for everybody's application, it's gonna be very unique. And so as a rule of thumb, you want to have a three inch back spacing or you can compensate that with some spacers. My 295, 75 on 17 inch rim tires do make contact with this kit. And so for my application, I'm going to need some different wheels. So I'm going to source some different wheels and put those on there so that when I articulate my tire isn't making contact with the top of the kit or the shock body itself. The other thing that's really important while you're doing this kit and you're flexing out the axle is you wanna make sure that nothing's getting hung up. It's not too taut and ultimately it's not ripping and breaking like an ABS sensor or your brake line or something of that nature. So just be really careful when you're under there messing around with things and yanking on it and so on and so forth. When you install these, again, you need to be prepared to release the gas out of the shock. That way you can compress the shock fully to really understand where your articulation lands and where you need to make adjustments and ultimately where you need to weld the bottom mounts on the axle. Now, like Taylor said, not everybody's gonna have nitrogen hanging out in their garage ready to fill up some shocks. If you do, great, but if you don't, you're gonna need to visit an off-road shop that's gonna be able to fill that up for you. I chose 12 inch box performance series 2.0 with resi shocks for my application. But this outboard shock relocation kit is very universal and will accommodate a wide variety of different shocks. This outboard shock relocation kit is very universal and you can pretty much get any shocks you want. This video is not to show you how to be a better welder. It's simply showing steps needed to install this kit. If you're not comfortable with your welding skills, I highly recommend bringing it to a professional. You want your welds to penetrate and be strong. Otherwise, this kit is pretty much useless. It's just gonna rip right off your frame. So if you need help installing this kit, come on down to FGP and see Taylor and he'll be happy to install it for you. He's in the San Bernardino County. If you're interested in purchasing this kit, head on over to Opt Off Road. We'll link them in the video description below where you can buy all of FGP's products. With all that said, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care, bye bye. And of course, sick mods all day, every day.